All right, so last year I did this stream. I did a, a whole thing about all the different types of penises, acoustic penises, the detachable penises, the exploding penises, the biggest penises, the smallest penises, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This year, my route is a little bit different and I've decided to do more like a storyline of a bunch of different animal stories and the way their sex lives work. Eight stories to tell you guys. We're gonna start with can't miss an eight inch clitoris. Do you guys know what has an eight inch clitoris by chance? Nice, yeah, hyenas. Hyenas have an eight inch long clitoris. You wanna see it? This is a hyena clitoris. This is a female hyena. You can't really tell just by looking at a hyena whether or not it's male or female because the female genitalia resembles male genitalia so much. No, that's not a penis. It is a clitoris. Not only do they copulate through the clitoris into it. Someone asked, is the urethra in the clitoris? Yes. They also pee through it. Worse than that, they also birth through it. They pee, they boink, and they birth through their clitoris. Note before I go through this whole stream, I'm gonna say boink a lot. And when I say boink, I mean have sex. Why though? Hyenas, females are socially dominant as it should be. Because they're socially dominant though, when baby hyenas are born, the dominant females don't want females to come up and take over. So a lot of times they'll be really aggressive with those babies, even kill those babies. And so it's in the baby's best interest to look like a male. That's one theory, is to keep the female baby safe from the dominant adult females. Another theory, avoiding forced copulation. They have to insert, male hyenas have to insert into there, which is very hard to do without the female being willing to let that happen. So that's another theory is to avoid forced copulation. The females get to decide when they want to boink. Oh, tragic though, with this system, 10% of first time hyena mothers die in birthing because it's very dangerous to birth through a canal that narrow and that long. And then this one's crazy, 60, 60 percent of cubs suffocate because their umbilical cords are too short for the birth canal. So they gotta make it out fast, otherwise they die. 60%. That's it for hyenas. The next story that we have is the birth, incest, and death speed run. Does anybody have a guess as to what species this is about? I haven't seen anybody say it. It's about the fig wasp. Fig wasp. You guys familiar? Just a little guy, and this is a fig. I don't wanna eat figs anymore. Have you guys ever heard that when you eat a fig, you're eating a dead wasp? Have you guys heard that? I've seen that online a bunch of times. Is that every fig? Not necessarily. Tons of fig species, but every single wild variety requires this system of pollination. They tried to import figs into Hawaii, but they didn't import fig wasps. They produced no fruits and they were like, ah, oh, shit. This is how this goes, okay? Little happy wasp. Oh, it's so cute, I'm so happy. Here she is. Then she goes and she finds a fig fruit. Ooh, yay, perfect fig fruit. Then she goes in there. This hole is too small for her to enter. So when she squeezes through there, she loses her wings and her antenna. It doesn't matter though, cause she's gonna die in there. She goes in there to die. So she crawls in there. She loses her wings and antenna when she goes in there. There's a bunch of flowers inside of a fig fruit. This is an unripe fig fruit. When she crawls in here, she pollinates all of these and lays eggs in them and then she dies. So if you are eating a fig that has been pollinated by a fig wasp, yes, there is a dead fig wasp in here, but wait, there's more. This is called the birth, incest, and death speed run, right? That's the title of this. Once the babies hatch, there are males and females. They immediately start copulating. Why would they do that with their brothers and sisters? You may ask. That's a little weird. Because the males are born wingless. Wingless, they cannot leave this fig. They can't leave. They are literally born inside the fig to mate and then die. So they all hatch out of their eggs. They start boinking with their sisters as many as they can. They start killing each other. They're super brutal to each other, the males. People have tried to study fig wasps. There's a scientist that tried studying, but, but every time he opened a fig, there was only one male alive every time. All these things happen very fast. The perfect life cycle, the males, their, their lifespan is one to two days. So this mom, this mom that flew into the fig, 
These babies, the daughters that have just boinked with the sons, they fly out of this fig and they go do the exact same thing that she just did in another fig, all in 24 to 48 hours. But the males never get to leave because they're wingless. They also die in there. So it's not just that you're eating one dead fig, uh, it's that you're eating a lot of them. Or a dead wasp, it's that you're eating a lot of them. This is really important for the fig fruit because it's the only way that it's pollinated. Because they get in there and they pollinate all these little flowers. Somebody asked how they maintain genetic diversity by boinking their brothers and sisters. That is an excellent question that I'm going to answer in lengthy detail in one of these stories, but not quite yet. So their only purpose is to reproduce so they can pollinate. Yes, they only live one to two days. Would you know if you ate a bunch of wasps or no? Um, they're only about a millimeter to five millimeters long. They're very, very small. They're completely safe to eat. So even if you are eating a fig and there are wasps in there, one, you probably wouldn't know and two, it's not gonna hurt you. So it doesn't really matter. It's just that people don't like that idea. How do the figs benefit from this? They're getting pollinated. The females pollinate while they're laying their eggs in there. Is it still vegan? Uh, you know, interesting question. Next up, we have when your kids have an orgy inside of you and then you explode. This is again about bugs. Obviously it's about bugs because this is an absolutely ridiculous, ridiculous sentiment. This is the name of the bug. If you would like instead, you may call it a mite because it is a mite. All right, this is just the scientific name. It's a parasitic mite. So you know what mealworms are, yeah? This mite is a parasite of the lesser mealworm beetle. So the females will go around and they'll suck up mealworm eggs and then their bodies will swell to 20 times, their bellies will swell 20 times their size. So they become like a little tennis ball with legs. It becomes impossible to move. This is what I was gonna show you. I was gonna lay on the ground and show you like what 20 times my belly size would be. Um, but unfortunately, we would need to use a drone to show, to show that. Let me see if I can show you if this is me. Yeah, no, I can't show you. I mean, it's like way bigger than that. <laughs> the thought was there. So they become this tennis ball with little legs. After she swells that much, she boinks, and then she's got a bunch of eggs inside of her, but she's already 20 times her size. So she can't fit anything more in there, but she has 50 babies inside of her. Insects have a lot of incest. Again, I'm going to go through why they can do that in just a bit. But when they have such short lifespans and such a, such a limited ability to travel, sometimes they don't have enough freaking time or ability to mate with anybody except for their brothers and sisters because they're right there, right now. So when she's got 50 babies in her stomach, and she's already 20 times her size and they all hatch inside of her, then they start copulating, boinking inside of their mom because they're ovoviviparous, they hatch inside and then they start mating inside the mom. But because there's so much in there and she's already 20 times her size, she usually explodes, like dies, like explodes, like explodes. The males rarely even get the chance to leave her body like leave the corpse because their lifespan's up and they've already boinked and then the females will leave. <laughs> That's the story of this mite. Bugs have to have sex with their brother, not all. A lot of bugs have to have sex with their brothers and sisters because their lifespans are short and they have a limited ability to travel. So why can bugs have so much incest and we can't? <laughs> well, because we are diploids, right? Diploid. Bugs have a system called haplodiploidy. I can either explain this in detail and give you guys a genetics lesson, or I can just tell you and you can take my word for it. Which would you prefer? Okay. A lesson. There's a lot to explain, okay? I'm gonna do my best. That is a female bee. This is a male bee. Here's what a female's genetics looks like. Females are diploids, okay? Males are haploids. Diploid is two. Haploid is one, 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 two. When you're a diploid, you can make four combinations here, okay? You could be capital A, capital B, because you have those two things. You could be capital A, lowercase b, because you have those two things. You could be A, B, because you have those things, or you could be lowercase A, lowercase b, because you have those things. This stupid boy, all he can do is capital A, capital B, because that's all he has. So if a female and a male were to mate, 
This is all the females possible combinations. This is the males possible combinations. This is a boink line. They have boinked. This is a Punnett square. When you take these two combinations, when you do like battleship, right? This and this, you get capital A, capital A, capital B, capital B. Same thing here and here. You get capital A, capital A, capital B, lowercase b. A, A, B, B, A, A, B, B. Great. These are all of the options that you can get when a male and a female mate, right? What do you notice about all of these babies? They're all diploid. When a male and a female bee boink, all of the babies are female. When a female lays eggs unfertilized by herself, what do you notice about all the babies? No boink line, there's no boinking. Haploid. What does this mean for bees? It means that males don't have a father. Because if you were born male, it was because a female laid unfertilized eggs. Your mother could be a virgin. But you do have a grandfather. Because if there was a female, it means there has to have been a male. If you're a male, you cannot have a son. Because if you're boinking with a female, you get all females. But if you're a male, you can have a grandson because if you mate with a female and you have females and she goes and lays unfertilized eggs, she can have sons. Does that make sense? <laughs> I didn't think that was that complicated either. Dude, Connor and I had like a breakdown about how this was so complicated and you guys would not understand and how can I make it with shapes instead or tallies instead and he was like you have to explain genetic diversity to them then because and I was like no I don't <laughs> I'm really glad that you understand this great so this is this is the system of, of haplodiploidy diploidy okay this is great for incest <laughs> because it reduces the chance of overlapping recessive genes. That's the problem that we have with incest. When we're both diploids and we're closely genetically related, you get a lot of over you can get a lot of overlap of recessive genes. This eliminates that problem because the female can have babies with unfertilized eggs, so they only have one copy of genes. This is the insect system of genetics. Not for all insects, a lot of them. Let me tell you a story. There's a little beetle. It's called a button beetle. Ew. It's called a button beetle because sometimes they live in buttons, literal buttons, okay? Some alt naturally they live in dates. This is a baby. This is a baby boy. This is a baby girl. Right after they hatch, they must boink. That's a boink line. But you know what? They're in love. <laughs> all of their brothers and sisters after hatching of button beetles, they all try to boink each other, the brothers and sisters, right? But, oh no, really sad, this, uh, sister, she didn't get to boink with her brother because he thought she was ugly. So she's all alone. No! But her purpose in life, in her few day life, is to uh, reproduce. Reproduce females, by the way, because they're more valuable than males. I'm not gonna explain why. <laughs> Generally speaking, they just are. So she didn't get to boink, okay? So then she leaves. She's like, oh, this is so sad. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go off by myself. Then she remembers. Wait a second, I can lay my own eggs without a man. I don't need a man. I can be independent and I can lay all these eggs myself, by myself. Yes, slay. I am a, a haplodiploidy, okay? She laid all these eggs without the help of a man. She is a virgin, this woman. So what are her babies? This is a test. All boys. And isn't that convenient? <laughs> Isn't that so convenient? This is exactly what she needed. <laughs> Boink! She's not a virgin anymore. She has sex with her sons. And then... She eats them. <laughs> Why? Because of resources. Because it's resourceful and all she needed was a male to reproduce with so that she can go lay more eggs that have now been fertilized by a male, which makes them what? Female. Mission complete. Can the males even eat? A lot of male insects are born without even, without wings, so they can't travel without mouth parts, so they eventually just starve and die. They're, <laughs> they're literally just born to mate with their sisters and then die. That's the story of the button beetle. Uh, in summary, female boinks, tries to boink with brothers and sisters. 
um, is unsuccessful, goes off by herself, lays eggs by herself, gets a bunch of boys, boinks all her sons, then eats her sons, then lays fertilized eggs that were fertilized by her sons, makes a bunch of girls, she dies. Done. It's the circle of life. You want to see the little freak? <laughs> this is the little freak button beetle. <laughs> That's a little certified freaky freak. That's the story of the button beetle. Next, we have a uh, death by incestual orgy. Any guesses? <laughs> I know we're going back on the incest thing, but I just explained to you why it happens so often. Why you're gonna hear about it so much. So yes, it is a bug. So there's actually, there's a moth. Oh, it's just a little happy moth. So cute, oh my God. Okay, and then there's a mite, another mite. I'm not even gonna tell you the scientific name because I just don't feel like it matters. And I don't think you're gonna remember it anyway. So there's a mite, okay? The, the mite is sitting in wait in this beautiful flower. Then the moth goes to pollinate the flower. And then the mite goes, Oh, stupid. Joke's on you. I'm gonna crawl in your freaking ear. <laughs> it's a parasitic mite. The mite goes and crawls in the moth's ear. This is an army worm moth. The, the moth looks like this. That's what the moth looks like, okay? It's a very cute moth. When the mite is in there, he takes a little sword. He doesn't really have a sword. It's just a mouth part. And he pierces the... <laughs> he pierces through the tympanic membrane of the moth. It causes permanent deafness. It makes it so the moth cannot hear anymore. He's deaf now. Why? Because the mite is a parasite and it's really handy to be in the ear because it's a very safe place to be and they feed off the moth's blood. So they go in there and then they just like drink the moth's blood <laughs> from in there. Uh, then the mite gets real comfy. This is the moth's ear. This is the little mite. Then the mite gets really comfy and then it lays a bunch of eggs. Remember, this story is called Death by Incestual Orgy. So guess what happens now? All the eggs hatch and they all start boinking inside of the moth's ear. Remember how I said that a lot of males are not equipped to live past boinking their sisters? It's <laughs> Ella just heard that as she was walking out. Males, once they boink all their sisters, they die in there. Inside the moth's ear, they just die and they stay in there forever and the females leave, but I will say something that's really considerate if, if you want to give the mites a cookie for a problem that they caused. When the females leave, they leave a trail of pheromones out of that ear. And so the next mite that goes to be a parasite inside this, this moth's ear, they go back into the same one. So they only go deaf in one ear instead of two, which is actually really considerate. Why? Because going deaf in two ears is bad for the moth. And if the moth dies, then they have no place to be a freaking parasite. So that ringing in my ear, this is only moths. They don't do this to us. Don't worry. Next up, we have Uno Reverse Genitalia Edition, where the females have a penis and the males have a vagina-like structure. I say penis because I mean that. And this is controversial. Some people don't think this, but the technical definition of a penis is a reproductive structure that transfers gametes from one member of the mating pair to another. That's what she's got. What are we talking about? <laughs> I'll show you. Whoa, penis. <laughs> Sorry, should have warned you. Um, I'm talking about bark lice. It's a little, it's a little soft-bodied, uh, flighted insect. Feeds on lichen, fungus. Lives in Brazilian caves. That's her penis. Some people don't like that because they're like, you should say penis-like structure because it's a female. But technically, she's got a reproductive organ that transfers gametes from one organism to another. That's a penis. Did you see this picture? That's her up there. It's labeled, you're welcome. That's her on top. That's him on the bottom. So she's a male? No, idiot. <laughs> they have just evolved external genitalia very differently, but it's also kind of the same. So the females penetrate the males. It's called a gynosone. It's a penis-like protrusion. And the male has a vagina-like organ it's really, I mean, it's a hole. The male does ejaculate. So it is a male. The male does, no, 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 no. The male does not get pregnant. The female penetrates the male with the penis. The male ejaculates inside of his own body. And then the penis goes from him up her penis to her. <laughs> like a vacuum. You want me to draw it? <laughs> this is the bark lice. Here she is. Here's her penis. Here he is. Penis is inside of this guy. He ejaculates in here. His sperm goes up like that. So she's not transferring gametes. Yes, she is. <laughs> the gametes are being transferred through her penis. Transfer, transfer, 
transfer. How does it feel? I don't know. I've never done that. <laughs> so you want to know another crazy thing about this? Guess how long this, this process lasts? Takes them 40 to 70 hours to copulate, to boink. They boink for 40 to 70 hours straight. You may ask, how the frick? They stay like this? They stay like this for 40 to 70 hours? Are you freaking serious? Yes. Why? Because her penis doesn't look like this. It looks like this. <laughs> Not only is her penis barbed, which is a very, I mean, she took that right out of the playbook. A lot of male animals have barbed penises. Cats have barbed penises. It's so that it guarantees more time for copulation and successful insemination because it's harder to get out of there. A lot of animals have barbed penises. You're right. I always do the barbs the wrong way, like a Christmas tree. So they have, the females have barred penises and the penis also inflates at the base of the, of the gynosome. The gynosome is the penis. It, they can inflate the base of it. So it's really, really freaking in there. And that's how they can do it for 40 to 70 hours because they're stuck together. Actually, they have tried in lab settings to pull them apart and the genitalia remains stuck together and the males rip, rip at the abdomen. They rip in half. How big is it? Bark lice are only three millimeters long. So proportionally, like really freaking small. You may be asking why? <laughs> because they live, remember I said they live in caves? So both resources in terms of mates and in terms of nutrients are very, very hard to find. I will repeat, the females are more important than the males. So this system gives the females all of the power inside that cave. Also the spermatophore, the sperm that they get has nutrients in it. So the females want to mate with as many males as possible because they get nutrients, because nutrients are so hard to find in the cave. So this allows them every time they find a male, whether he wants to or not, she can boink and then she can slurp and she can be nourished. Next up, to love is to disintegrate and die. I will give you a hint. You might be excited to learn this. Uh, this is not about a bug. You wanna play some Pictionary? I'm gonna draw it. You can guess what it is. Anglerfish, correct. This is an anglerfish. I've never drawn an anglerfish before, okay? It's, it's kind of what they look like. Yes, in Nemo. Okay, you've seen in Finding Nemo, the fish with the, the bioluminescent on the front. Parasitic males. Good. Yes. Um, anglerfish, their sex life is very interesting and very reminiscent of deadbeat men. It's called sexual parasitism. If this is a female anglerfish, this is a male. The size difference is absolutely insane crazy difference how do they do it i'm glad you asked this male let me blow him up here this male lacks many things he does not have a digestive system a respiratory system is he alive basically no he's missing many things that he needs you know who has all of these things she does he's like oh my gosh what a perfect opportunity let me bite her let me excrete enzymes onto her skin that fuse me to her so we become one and then she can give me access to her digestive system so he can get nutrients and her circulatory system so that he can get gas exchange and all he will do is provide her with sperm so he will inseminate. Here's a bit of a cuck though. Um, she can have up to eight of these guys latched onto her at once. <laughs> which is kind of sick. Um, so there is competition in sperm delivery. Do they stay on there forever? Yeah, until they die. How do they find the females? I think, I'm sure there are also like pheromones involved or something. You guys want to see what that looks like? That's an angler fish, first of all, that's a female. That's a male attached to her at the bottom. You see that? So to love is to disintegrate and die. There you go, angler fish. We are done with insects actually. The last two that we have are not insects. I have another mammal coming up here. We have the one and done. Again, the mammal stories are just not as interesting as the insect stories. So this one's gonna be relatively quick, but essentially there is a marsupial from Australia. It looks like a little mouse. This is what it looks like. He's cute. It's called an atechnus. Atechnus. 
It looks like a rodent, like it looks like a little mouse, but it's not, it's not a marsupial. So around 11 months of age, those guys start irreversibly producing sperm. Like they start and then they don't stop. Um, and it changes their behavior dramatically. They become ravenous for mating. They mate with as many females as possible, starting at about 11 months of age. Every encounter that they have with the female, the mating lasts, guess how long? It's uh, 14 hours, up to 14 hours. These encounters will last with females. They mate so furiously though, and they like stop eating and stop taking care of themselves because their sole purpose at 11 months old is just to mate vigorously. And then they start like dying. Their bodies start to fall apart. They start losing fur. They start to have internal bleeding, immune system failure. Their bodies get overtaken by gangrene. And then a few, just a few weeks shy of their first birthday, they die because they've had too much sex. Some people are saying, why would that be a benefit? The theory is that they are fully sacrificing themselves for the next generation. Realistically, again, males can go around and inseminate a bunch of females, but we need very few males because one male can inseminate like at this rate, God knows how many females. And then you don't really need them anymore because they've already inseminated so many females. So they just self-sacrifice for the next generation. Plus they have a really short lifespan anyway. So you might as well get in the grind set, I guess. I don't know. The last story that I have to tell you guys about today is the three foot long exploding sperm bomb. Whoever guesses what animal this is gets a cookie. Octopus, correct. Let me show you how long three feet is. This is one foot two feet. <laughs> it's about three feet long. <laughs> That's a big exploding sperm bomb. I didn't have a tape measure. Octopuses have a uh, three foot long exploding sperm bomb. Giant octopuses do. There's lots of species, right? Um, but here's how octopus mating works. If this is an octopus, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Where do you think his penis is? Yeah, it is one of the legs. Penis. That is his penis. Where do you think her vagina is? In her head. Yeah, about here. Scientists sometimes call it their nostril. Don't mind the anatomy of my smiley faces. There are a few ways of insemination here. One is the reach. One is they'll just go like this and like reach in there. Um, other methods are detachment. So they just, they reach in there and then they detach it and they just leave it there. And they're like, all right, I'm out. Don't worry about me. I'm leaving. Another method, uh, they can detach their, it's called a hectocotylus, their penis arm. There could be an octopus over here and he could detach his hectocotylus and it'll swim over to her <laughs> drone dick. <laughs> Projectile peen, sperm missile, pocket rocket. All right, great, good job, guys. I think that's good. Ballistic, yep, I think you get the point. They can detach their penis. Their penis can swim on its own over to her. They can do the reach around. The cool thing about her is she can collect multiple. She can have several at a time. She can carry them around if she wants to. The bummer about octopus mating, after they mate, they have a pretty severe post nut depression. It's called senescence. They stop eating entirely and they go into caring for the babies. The male die, the males die shortly after mating. Um, and so do the females when she lays the eggs, she gets depressed and then she lays the eggs and then she dies. Yeah. There's your story about octopus. Um, some females can be six and a half feet in length while males are just one inch in length. What? Six and a half feet versus one inch. So the size difference can be significant. That's why the reach around method is not safe. The giant octopus passes a spermatophore that's over three feet long to the female giant octopus. It contains more than 10 billion sperm and then it explodes in the female reproductive tract. 10 billion sperm is a lot per human ejaculation. Average human males do 20 to 150 million sperm per ejaculation, 20 to 150 million, whereas giant octopus do 10 billion. So it's about a hundred times more sperm than people, uh, but also giant octopuses can reach 30 feet long and they can weigh 600 pounds. So it's kind of fair. I think that's all I have. <laughs> Admittedly, I didn't have nearly as much time this year 
as I did last year to uh, research and give you guys a bunch of information, but I did my best to get this stream in. Anyway, even though there's a ton going on right now, I learned so much. Did I miss anything about hyenas? Yes, they have an eight inch long clitoris that they pee and copulate and birth through. I hope you guys learned a lot. I hope you have some stuff that you can go home and share with your friends and family. See you tomorrow. Good luck. Thanks for watching. Bye.